You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to VanuPodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast, if anything found on the website, unless otherwise noted, is covered by a dip cost of no government license, as well as reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. Uh, learn more by visiting bipot.org. So, uh, on today's episode of our Crypto Anarchism series, I welcome Demelza Hayes to the podcast. Uh, she is a PhD student in our business economic uh, in the business economics program at the University of Liechtenstein, the editor of the crypto research report published by Incrementum AG, as well as a fund manager of a regulated alternative investment fund uh, that invests in cryptocurrencies at Incrementum AG. Uh, she was also featured in Forbes's 30 under 30 list uh, last year, I think it was. So now before I bring her in, let me set the stage for our discussion today. Uh, earlier this month, and I think she's still there actually, uh, she attended the Outback Forum, an event in Austria that featured prominent economic and political leaders from all over the world. Uh, apparently the conference was riddled with pro-European Union central planners, uh, Demelza being one of the only ones there who, well, I guess cared about decentralization and uh, economic freedom. Uh, so we'll talk about the forum, uh, why she thinks the war is lost, and uh, some solutions that uh, she sees to this problem. Uh, so in this episode, rather than focusing on the what's and how's, uh, we're more so going to discuss the uh, discuss why uh, Bitcoin and these other crypto anarchist tools are necessary. So without further ado, Demelza, welcome to the Vani Podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you a lot for having me again, Shane. Uh, sorry, there's a couple cars going by, but I wanted to uh, actually start out by just showing everybody where Outback is. I'm still here in Outback. And I'm not sure if you can see the video, but this is the mountains behind me. Uh, it's a little bit uh, overcast today. Oh, yeah. Coming through great on the video. Yeah, definitely. And actually, this behind me is, is the Liechtenstein flag. Uh, this is the, the Liechtenstein flag um, because I'm staying at the official house for the Liechtenstein Club Outback, which basically is six or seven people from Liechtenstein or that are in Liechtenstein that are representing Liechtenstein at the Outback Forum. Okay, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, or I'm glad you uh, showed the video because um, that will uh, that will definitely uh, look great on uh, on YouTube. So um, I guess uh, um, now I interviewed you uh, I guess last year probably maybe uh, I guess uh, maybe middle of last year. Um, <clears throat> but uh, that was for uh, Liberty Attack Radio. So this is a different podcast, different audience. So uh, I'll start. Uh, I guess we can start by uh, um, by, have, uh, by having you introduce yourself. So uh, who are you and uh, what do you do? Okay, well, my name is Demelza Hayes. And as you mentioned, I am a doctoral student in business economics at the University of Liechtenstein. And I'm also a teacher there. I've been teaching a course on cryptocurrencies for the past three years. And I also teach corporate finance corporate finance, cor uh, principles of finance, and I am a fund manager at Incrementum Age, which is a licensed wealth management firm in Liechtenstein that uses Austrian economics to have actively managed accounts for basically high net worth individuals. And then we also have funds, regulated fund products um, in alternative asset classes, including cryptocurrencies. And finally, we have research. So we have two different research uh, teams and one research team is on gold and they produce a report called In Gold We Trust, which has been published for about 12 years. And now we produce the crypto research report, which has been published since 2017. And uh, that focuses of course on cryptocurrencies. So I'm kind of one foot in academia and one foot in the industry. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. So I, I do want to just talk, talk a little, uh, uh, talk, talk a bit about Incrementum uh, AG for a moment. Um, now that was the first, and I, I think we, I think we talked about this last year too. But uh, I noticed it again when I was, uh, you know, browsing the site a couple days ago in preparation for this interview. But it's really awesome to see human action uh, by Mises on the recommended reading list of an investment firm's website. Uh, you know, it's good for the people that handle your money to to understand economics, right? Um, so that that was uh, uh, cer certainly re refreshing to see. Um, so so I guess could you talk a little bit about 
Awards um, since uh, obviously the, the the investment world. I'm sure they have to to comply with uh, you know um, worldwide financial regulations and all that. So how, how does it? Um, I guess could, could you talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and the way that that's treated? I guess treated in in uh, your field and, and kind of uh, the work that you do. Definitely. Well, I think. I mean, there's a lot to say. I mean, first, the thing that shocked me the the most was the difference between retail and professional investors. And I guess a lot of like the average household is a retail, what's considered a retail investor. And you're a retail investor as long as you have less than I think it in in Switzerland at least it's 2.5 million in assets under a, assets like net wealth, uh, personal net wealth. Wealth and in the U.S., it's also I have to check, but I think it's also around 2.5 million. I have to check that. But basically, if you're not a wealthy person, you're considered an, a retail investor. And like all university endowments, pensions, um, insurance companies, they're all automatically in the professional investor status. And most financial products are only allowed to be sold to professional investors. And mm. retail investors are are barred from most investments. Um, and I didn't realize that growing up as a retail person that I wasn't even exposed to the kind of financial products that, that wealthy people are exposed to. And cryptocurrencies are actually, be because they're deemed very risky, they're basically deemed to be invest investment products only for professional investors because they argue that retail investors like actually aren't capable of analyzing risks as well as professional investors and therefore we don't want grandma investing in cryptocurrencies lo losing her shirt and then being a burden on society so that's kind of the argument they make uh, uh to keep to keep retail uh investors from investing uh sorry go ahead oh i was, I was just yeah that, that's interesting yeah go yeah go ahead yeah so it was quite shocking for me so i mean basically we wanted to release a retail product that the average person could invest in and gain exposure to cryptocurrencies but because of different regulations we were forced into providing only a professional uh product and there's ways to get around that, which interestingly just cost money. Like we can basically just pay money to release what's called a certificate on top of our fund. And then it, then we can sell it to retail investors. So basically if we spend more money on compliance, we can take a risky asset and uh, package it in a way so that retail investors can invest. So, I mean, the whole entire thing is this, uh, you know, red tape and, and bureaucracy, but you know, and then it's like, well, wait, if I pay more money to get on top of a fund that's risky, how does that take away the riskiness? Like it, yeah. it, it doesn't really make sense, but bas basically the way that it works is, so you have like Cayman Island funds that uh, basically the person that stores your private keys and the person that makes decisions regarding cryptocurrencies to buy and sell and when to build those positions or to liquidate those positions in Cayman funds, that, that can be the same role. But in the European Union and in the European economic area, they forced three roles for funds so that basically nobody can store the private key. So the person that stores the private key is not also the person that makes decisions regarding what to buy and sell. Mm. That's what kind of makes the funds in Europe unique is that you have to have a custodian bank that says we will actually store the cryptocurrencies on the behalf of the fund. And if anything happens to those cryptocurrencies, we're liable. And there's only one bank in all of Europe right now, including Gibraltar and Malta and Luxembourg and Andorra, all the all the you know tax haven countries. There's only one country that's that's got a bank that's willing to do that, and there's only one bank in that country that is uh, willing to do that, and that's Bank Frick. So Bank Frick is basically the custodian for all funds that are offering access to cryptocurrencies, direct access. Single, single point of failure monopoly, you know, and then, uh, you know, all the regulations have forced, you know, basically only one bank to go. And it's really, it gets really interesting because this bank actually uh, lost their USD correspondent bank because they went into the cryptocurrency space. And so most banks aren't willing to go into the cryptocurrency space because they will lose their USD correspondent bank, which settles all of their USD transactions, which for most banks, around the world that makes up the majority of their transactions so this bank is basically betting on crypto and shorting the dollar essentially gotcha um now now i know i, I think you mentioned that it's it's the only bank that'll deal with cryptocurrencies um there was something that happened i, I guess it came out maybe a few months ago maybe mid-may um but uh, but with tether um and uh, tether and, and and i guess a, a bank like that is that the, is that the same bank are you familiar with that situation at all it's not the same bank um that I'm not very familiar with that situation, um, but I think that I think that from my understanding, I, I'm not really familiar with that situation. 
and and just to clarify one thing there's a lot of banks that will hold crypto on the behalf of their clients or they will bank crypto businesses but what they're doing is they're is they're saying if our crypto storage gets hacked we're not liable that's what mm -hmm. most banks say even fidelity even fidelity's digital assets storage uh for in institutional uh, customers in Boston is not liable. Like if you read the small print, so there's only one bank that's actually saying that's actually saying if we get hacked, if if our crypto gets stolen, we will give you new crypto and we'll okay, use our right. equity in our bank to get that crypto off the market. Yeah, but I'm not really sure about the the tether. I mean, the tether's had a ton of issues with with banking over the years. Right, right. Okay, gotcha. That's that. Yeah, I, I like that. There, there was an exchange I used to use, and I don't use any KYC exchanges or anything. It was uh, it's called it was called Cryptopia, and um, they um, yeah they they got hacked. I guess it would have been um uh, this year earlier this year at some point, and they're actually going to put the money back into the users' accounts, which most exchanges don't do. That it's kind of well. Sorry, uh, I guess guess you're just I guess you're just screwed. So yeah, that, I guess that that is a, that is a positive a, a positive thing overall, especially for for I guess um, if if it's giving retail retail investors an opportunity to get in, to get into the space. Although I, I although I would prefer obviously just with the nature of Bitcoin, it would be better if they held their own private keys. But hey, it's a not a perfect world, right? <laughs> so definitely, uh, it's it's great when there's exchanges that are willing to put up a part of their you know, revenues into a pot for paying out getting hacked because getting hacked is statistically, you know, highly probable and and it makes sense that they they kind of protect their their retail clients even though they're not forced to by law. So I really like that, mm -hmm. you know, about the different exchanges that are, that are taking it upon themselves voluntarily to pay out clients that get hacked. Right. Right, and and I will mention just for just for individ individuals who may uh, who may hold Bitcoin um, uh, that are listening to this podcast, who may who may not have listened to a, a few of our previous episodes uh, in the crypto in our crypto anarchism series. Um, but yeah, that's that's why I love the the Noddle device so much. Um, gives you the ability to to make offline transactions um, and keep those private keys entirely offline. So as far as security for for individuals, I will uh, drop a link in the show notes to that. Um, again, yeah, there's there's no paid advertising or anything. It's just uh, I these these are yeah very very important products. So I guess. Uh, uh, is, is, is there anything else you wanted to, to discuss, uh, I, I guess, uh, on the line of thought that we've been going down? Or I, I, I'm, I'm excited to get into, I guess, this uh, strategic relocation question uh, in regards to Liechtenstein. But uh, anything else so far? No, let's go ahead and talk about Liechtenstein. That's another one of my favorite topics. <laughs> awesome. So, so yeah, I mentioned I mentioned this to you in pre-show, but for, for for the benefit of the uh, benefit of the listeners, um, but yeah, I'm interested to learn a little more a little bit more about Liechtenstein. Uh, we we've talked about uh, as a strategy for personal freedom, uh, strategic relocation, and also perpetual traveling um, as uh, two potential options for individuals who want to make themselves more invulnerable to the coercion of uh, of the state, basically by voting voting with their feet, um, maybe voting with their feet uh, very often. But uh, anyway. Yeah, could, could you tell? Could you speak a little bit to, I guess, uh, the political climate, uh, economic freedom, taxation, regulations, enforcement, et cetera, of Liechtenstein, um, and also kind of uh, how it compares and contrasts from the USA? Definitely. Okay, so basically, let's see where to start. I mean, the the one thing that I think makes Liechtenstein unique from every other country is the fact that the right to municipal determination is written into the constitution. So basically, the prince uh, Hans Adam. He wrote a book called The State in the Third Millennium, which is a political treatise. And that book basically discusses the role between citizens and the state. And basically, uh, you know, in that, in that book, he outlines that states that work with their citizens on a voluntary basis are going to attract the best citizens. And states that work with their citizens on a, on a you know, involuntary basis are going to basically be left with, the, you know, the least productive and lowest amount of capital. So, so you know, the best states will attract the highest capital and talent, skilled labor force. And uh, with his land or her, her land or their land and basically, ex, uh, you know, being part of Liechtenstein, the country, and, and while keeping their land. And uh, the Princely family doesn't earn a single penny from taxpayer money. They're all self-funded. And when the prince made this suggestion, uh, Parliament actually said, no, we won't allow that, but we will allow the municipal level. And what that means is that any municipality in Liechtenstein, if they have a majority vote, so uh, for example, Planken, it's the smallest municipality in Liechtenstein, they have 400 people approximately. If you get a 201 people with a direct democracy vote to leave 
uh, they can make a new state. And that's mm. what's really unique about Liechtenstein. Um, no, con no, yeah, no municipality has has done it so far. But and and so we we have not seen yet if the country would actually allow it to occur if if somebody actually decided to do this. But what I think is important about this principle being in the constitution is that it protects the minority because, in my opinion, you're either going to have tyranny of the majority with democracy or you're going to have tyranny of the minority with a dictatorship or monarchy or whatever. So mm -hmm. if you have demo democracy in place, there's no way for the minority to exit what the majority wants. And I think by allowing the municipalities to leave, this gives the minority some protection because what it does is it makes the majority vote in a way that doesn't abuse the minority because they know if they vote in a way that abuses the minority too much, the minority will break away from Liechtenstein and create their own state. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. Interesting. It reminds me of um, I don't remember what section it is in the uh, in, in the Texas Constitution, but um, they they have uh, it's explicit there too that Texans have the right to alter alter or abolish. Now, so so I think that's an interesting element, and, and Liechtenstein's definitely a different uh, just from what I've heard so far. It's uh, definitely a different political climate. But I, I guess um, it, it, has there just not really been a need for that yet? Um, like, uh, how, how's the general? Like, obviously, um, you, you know what's going on in, in, in the USA about um, you know the, the I guess the the, the coming at some point uh, economic collapse. It's not a very good situation here. So I guess um, could, could you talk a little bit uh, about the political climate over there, the economy, things of that nature? Definitely. I mean, that's another reason I feel really. I mean, sometimes I really miss the United States and I miss my family and I want to move back there. But the direction Liechtenstein is headed and it's just so positive. There's no public debt. I mean, they run surpluses almost every year, uh, but they have no cumulative debt like the United States or like most of the countries in, in Europe. So, I mean, that's fantastic. And most of the, you know, most of the states in the United States and also the states, the member states of the European Union are all having problems with their pensions where they have huge unfunded liabilities. China is not in that situation. Their pension system is actually looking very good. They have competition between different companies that invest your money and in, in, you know for you for your pension it is mandatory by law but there's competition and you can choose which which company you want to put your retirement with and um and also in general there's no there's no i've never seen a homeless person in Liechtenstein. i've never seen anybody on the streets i mean it's a community it's a very small rural community with 30 35 000 people approved approximately mm -hmm. um, every day 35,000 people drive into the country from other from Germany, Austria and, and Switzerland in order to work there. I think the median income is around 100,000. So, I mean, for example, like there's people that work at Subway, like the sandwich shop and they're min like there's no minimum wage in Liechtenstein, like that that law doesn't exist, but at Subway the entry uh, level salary for like a 16-year-old that's first it's their first job, they're getting paid 21 Swiss francs per hour. So that's that's approximately $21 per hour oh, wow. entry level position to make sandwiches. So I mean, I started out working at Quiznos in the United States when I was 16 in 2006 and I was earning $6 and 25 cents. So I mean, the wages are at least triple in Liechtenstein. Yeah. So but generally everybody has enough to go around and it's it's a very it's a very wealthy country overall. I mean, you have a lot of really wealthy people that have foundations there that have special tax benefits. As far as taxes go, I think that the maximum federal tax is 11%, but that's for the highest earners. And you have, I think my federal tax rate was 3%. And then you have municipal level taxes, just kind of like how we have federal and state. And at the, at the municipal level or like the state level, they it can it can go up to seven percent. So the highest maximum tax rate for the highest income earner is eighteen percent. I think that's approximately what it is. And but that's you know that's for people that are earning like I don't know what it is. It's over seven hundred thousand dollars per year or something like that. So most people are below the the level required to pay any taxes, which I think is, is around seventy thousand dollars. So up to seventy thousand dollars, you're not paying anything. Basically, every single year, I I get taxes back. And once I'm above a hundred thousand, I have to actually pay U.S. taxes on a hundred thousand dollars. So once I get close to a hundred thousand, like once I get around ninety thousand, I'm I'm actually just not going to work anymore, and I'm going to take certain days of the week off 
and just stay below 90,000 and just have free time. Yeah, and isn't that God? I I I despise. Um, obviously, I despise the state, but it, it's it's obviously just a parasitical institution. But but then it's incentives. It incentivizes people like uh, it's like uh, in incentivizes people not to work, right? Um, and and it's cra it's crazier even for you. I wrote about this in my book. But territorial taxation versus re residential taxation. The U.S. is one of only like two or three countries in the world that no matter where in the world or the Milky Way galaxy you make your money, they want their cut. <laughs> they want their cut. Um, so. So I guess that, that that was at least what I what I what I discovered. So is that threshold a hundred thousand then for for owing taxes on money earned outside of the United States? It's each country has their own agreement uh, with the United States, and certain that different countries have different amounts. I think Liechtenstein it's like ninety nine thousand eight hundred. It's like ninety nine thousand eight hundred. It's basically a hundred thousand. But if you earn one dollar over that amount, you have to pay taxes on a hundred thousand. So it's not like I have to pay taxes in the U.S. on the dollar that I make over a hundred thousand, it's at once I hit that boundary, I'm paying full taxes on the hundred thousand. So it's it's really ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 no surprise that a lot of people are leaving and rescinding their citizenships, right? Yeah, it's no surprise, no surprise at all. So I, I guess I, I guess another question I I have for you is I, I I know we I think you I think you mentioned it just just very briefly in passing in our last interview, but the importance of uh, you know being international internationally mobile or having you know internationally mobile capital. So could you speak to I guess uh, international mobility and also was that a, was that a factor in why you decided to um, pursue education and a career in Liechtenstein? Well, that's a great point. I mean, I. I'm kind of like a homebody myself. I like to just live on my land and live off the grid and and just, you know, have my, you know, little my little kingdom to myself. Um, but I definitely think capital mobility is really important. I would I would definitely if I was in America, I would try to invest in companies that are outside of America, get offshore accounts and invest in funds that are outside of America. I mean, basically have access to financial resources outside of the United States, uh, however possible. And I mean, it, it, it definitely like my education was free in Europe. So I mean, well, free, you know, with, I mean, by free, the, the taxpayers in, in France paid for my education and the taxpayers in Liechtenstein paid for my education. So I have to be very grateful to those people that, that got forced into paying for, for a foreigner's education. But I was able to basically do my master's degree and my bachelor's degree for, for absolutely no money at all. Um, in fact, I was employed by the universities that I worked for, so I actually earned money while while going to school. Mm -hmm. But but my main concern for for leaving the United States was basically I get anxiety whenever I'm there. I feel like the economy is going um, very in the wrong direction, and people are you know increasingly reliant on on the government to solve their problems. And I think that once the government's bankrupt, there's there's going to be you know a lot of civil unrest. And and at that point, I don't I don't want to put my family in danger. So. For me, this was the best solution, but I mean, it comes at, it comes at huge costs. I mean, you know, Liechtenstein and Europe in general is, is packed with people. I mean, it's just, it's impossible to get land. I mean, you're, you're talking about like for a one bedroom apartment where I live, you're talking about paying a million dollars. So, oh, wow. it, you know, if you want to have land, yeah. I mean, if you want to have land where I live, you, you need to be a millionaire and they make it set up so that the average person can become a millionaire. I mean, I know a lot of average people, like I, I know a cleaning lady that has a BMW and owns a home in Liechtenstein, you know, and, and she's earning, you know, a hundred dollars an hour cleaning homes, but it's, you know, it's, it, there's not a lot of space here. And then in that case, you know, I would love to go out to Wyoming or Montana or Idaho and buy a huge track of land and, you know, live off of the land. But, I mean, it's just looking so bleak for me, the future of the United States. I, I don't know how to, you know, how to manage that, but which is really sad. I mean, I wish I, I, I want to do anything possible to, to help the United States because I think that it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's an anomaly in the history of mankind. And I think it would be really horrible to lose what the United States built. Sure, sure. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and I'm and I'm with you, and, and this is something that's uh, rare. The main proponent of Vanu talked about. He actually was a, he actually like a, at least in terms of the United States, um, with, uh, with land ownership being fee simple and not a lodial title, where the state can, the state is is literally your landlord property taxes. I mean, everyone knows it that they just don't they just don't don't call it that, um, or that they can just take it through civil asset forfeiture or nuisance abatement or or, or whatever. But 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a tough subject. Like uh, I've I've got a home set out in Southern Illinois, and obviously I'm I'm very very aware of of what what you're talking about. I'm very aware of you know the the possibilities in, in the future whenever whenever it whenever it does happen because you know, we we can't ever predict it, right? We don't know if it's going to happen a year or ten years down the road. But yeah, I don't know. Um, kind of do the homesteading thing for now, and and I guess uh, you know uh, um, where it's where it's extremely cheap to live here. The uh, the property taxes where I live, it it costs as much for one month of living in Austin, Texas. So I think I. And like uh, the, as much money as I'm saving here for for living, um, I think it's beneficial. But yeah, I think at some point, at, at some point, uh, it'll be time to leave the states. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know, uh, it's just just what it is, right? It's uh, the world we live in. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, Liechtenstein does have property taxes. Um, they're they're pretty low relatively, but what what they don't have is eminent domain. I mean, it's it's there's no public railroad system. There's no highway going through the country. I mean, it's their families that live in Liechtenstein have had their land for hundreds of years, and it would be, you know, it, it would be it cause huge civil unrest if the state did any kind of imminent imminent domain. Um, I was even speaking to a friend from Liechtenstein a couple, couple years ago about how they do imminent domain in the United States, and I mean, he was just shocked, like he was appalled that the government could just take land from people by force and then give them whatever amount of money. I mean, he said his land is priceless, right? It's his family's heritage, it's it's, it's his history, so mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter what kind of road they want to put through, it's it's not worth it for him. So they don't have that that kind of ability to take the land from people, but they do have property taxes, and yeah, I mean, they they do, you know, it's you're forced to buy health insurance, but you you have to select from a, a different few different companies, but you're forced to buy it. And I mean, I think, you know, it's not the perfect place, but it's for me, it's 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 relatively good because Liechtenstein is competing with all of the states or cantons, what's called cantons in Switzerland, and the the Switzerland basically has many states competing with each other within the. Helvetica Union, like within the Federation of Switzerland, and they compete with each other on taxes, on yeah, all sorts of different things. Like they'll they'll attract, for example, they'll attract people to live in their canton by saying, "We'll give you land at a very cheap price if you promise to put your children into school." You know, stuff like that. So because basically a lot of these rural communities are are, are the population is aging, and so they want. They want young people moving in with families and they'll, you know, they'll try to attract families with, with cheap land or they will uh, have really low taxes. And Liechtenstein, because it's it has a border with Switzerland, it it's forced to compete with all those states in Switzerland. And I think that that competition, uh, plus having, you know, a very high trust, low time preference culture uh, makes it a very nice place to live uh, with a high standard of living. Right, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's 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 definitely uh, definitely very interesting. So I suppose uh, I'm trying to think of anything else in, in terms of uh, strategic relocation. I, I guess uh, something you've kind of, you've you've brought up a couple of times is that the the barriers to entry are obviously significantly lower than than in the states. And uh, um, you mentioned the subway, the the subway. Uh, sandwich artist, I guess, is is what they're called, making twenty one dollars an hour. Um, I, I guess uh, what about uh, I guess um, I guess what about uh, the cost of living? Are things generally more expensive there, um, or I would think they'd be cheaper since there would be um, less regulations and and things of that nature. No, it's extremely expensive. It's it's yeah. more expensive. In Liechtenstein is 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 very expensive, and so is Zurich. So Switzerland and Liechtenstein are more expensive than any town I've been to in the United States by by a factor of two. So like 100% or, yeah, 100% more expensive or, or, you know, twice as expensive. And basically my explanation of why that is because the borders are closed. I mean, there are no, for example, like all, all the jobs are done by locals. So for example, you have local Liechtensteiners collecting the trash. You have local Liechtensteiners uh, delivering the post. You have local Liechtensteiners um, doing the agriculture, doing the building. So there's no immigrants on 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 any of the services. And uh, if somebody wants to get into the country, I would suggest to go through the university because the university is is hiring and giving student visas, so student visas, and also hiring faculty and. The wages are, I mean, even though it's really expensive to live in Liechtenstein, the wages are even higher than the factor of the costs. So, for example, teachers, like doctoral students, doctoral students at the University of Liechtenstein can earn 
approximately 80,000 US dollars per year to study to do your PhD, you're going to earn about 80,000. And if you actually stay on as a postdoc or go into assistant professor or associate professor, um, you're you're going to be earning like 150,000 a year to to teach at the University of Liechtenstein. So it's really huge salary. If you work in the private sector in finance, uh, you can basically easily start your own company. You can get meetings with the financial market authority just by sending them an email, or people can reach out to me, and then I can put you in touch with them. Uh, you know, of course, just I mean for no cost or anything. I just want to help people um, improve their lives. And, and basically, you know, if you make your own startup here, you, you can be earning hundreds of thousands. And I mean, that sounds crazy, right? But I I've been here for three and a half years. And I mean, when I left Tampa, I was driving for Uber. Like when I left Florida, I was driving for Uber, you know, making like, I don't know, $8 an hour. Mm -hmm. And in the past three and a half years, I, I mean, now I'm going to hit the, the hundred thousand dollar mark soon. In, and it's just because and I'm just doing average work, like I'm doing finance and it's, yeah, it's not like I'm doing anything particularly special. It's just the fact that in the United States, if I wanted to offer a crypto fund product, I'm talking about millions of dollars in legal fees to get it registered with the Securities Exchange Commission. And in Liechtenstein, you're talking about like $18,000, you know, and I mean, it, you just get five people together to put in $3,000 each and then you have basically a prospectus approved uh, to issue a security. So, I mean, it's it's really so much cheaper here to issue financial products. And I mean, for example, like if you have an idea to do anything, like if you want to, um, I don't know, start a new uh, ride sharing company or a new like home sharing company, and you need to raise capital, you could in Liechtenstein register your security offering for basically 18,000 and then start raising capital right away and selling shares to people. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing how streamlined the entire process of capital raising is in Liechtenstein and how they make it really easy to go literally from rags to riches, uh, which I think is what the United States used to do uh, before they, you know, before the Securities Exchange Commission Act of 1933 and then the Howey Test laws that were created um, after, you know, the, the Orange Grove owner in Florida sold unregistered securities. I think that was like 1952 or something. So mm -hmm. uh, ever since then, it's basically been possible to, to easily raise capital in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I guess another thing that comes to mind along these, uh, I guess, uh, you know, along these same lines is <clears throat> basically it seems like uh, if, uh, if a Vanuan or I guess just a perpetual traveler was going to move to Liechtenstein, they'd either have to be retired or they would have to have some sort of online business I would, uh, since, since everything there is done locally. So that, that's, that's what it sounds like. Uh, and, and what about, uh, I guess, uh, how, how hard is it for a foreigner to own land? Like uh, if, someone, if someone's an American, they move to Liechtenstein. You mentioned the, the expensive cost, but say they're, say they're multimillionaire million multi-millionaire and, and they want to buy a house so how hard is it how hard is it for a foreigner to own property there so i know in mexico it's very very difficult uh it really depends i mean there's always ways around everything i mean for example like i mean there's people that buy that buy citizenships in Liechtenstein, depending on what they can negotiate with the government and you can also negotiate your tax rate with the government as well so there, it's all up for negotiation but for example like if you, basically what an American could do is they would have to find what's called a local Troy hand, which is basically a trustee, and they make the trustee, uh, which is the local person, you need to have one local person in order to register a business. So you would need to find a Troy hand, but there's thousands of services in Liechtenstein for Troy hands. And then what you have to do is you have to register a company, usually an Anstalt or an Aktion Gesellschaft, which is an AG, uh, which is basically the equivalent of like a, a corporation. Mm -hmm. And then what you could do is you can buy a house with that company and rent it out to yourself or rent it out to whoever you want. But but what you can do is, for example, you can buy an Anstalt and then you can buy land with that Anstalt or you can buy an Aktion Gesellschaft, form a company. Aktion Gesellschaft, I think it's $50,000 to, to, to found it, which means that capital has to stay in the company, but it does, it's not, that's not the cost. So what it means is that basically... In the United States, you have uh, sorry, you have limited liability corporations like in Florida, which literally you don't have to put up any startup capital in order to get started. So if somebody sues my my Florida, uh, my Florida limited liability corporation, my LLC, they're not going to be able to get any money out of that company because there's no equity that was used to form the company. The company holds no money. So basically, it's protecting me without having to put any money, any skin in the game. And 
Liechtenstein does not have any kind of company like that. that. That's an American thing. And here, all the companies require a certain amount of capital so that if somebody sues me, they're actually going to be able to get something out of the company. So the Anstalt, I registered an Anstalt in Liechtenstein that costs 30000 um, in ground capital, with ground capital, which means that money is still mine. And I can use that money within the company to do whatever I want. Um, uh, like pay for costs and everything like that, but and the the auction gazelle shaft is fifty thousand, I believe, and then from there on you can start buying anything you want to put into it. So I I don't think it's necessarily a problem of of being American or not. I mean Americans can't directly buy land if they have no residence here and if they uh, don't have a company here. But there's always ways around it. Just it it just requires legal loopholes. Got you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That that doesn't sound uh, that doesn't sound. Uh too bad at all obvious for 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 a wealthy for a wealthy individual um 18,000 or 50 grand especially when you consider the tax savings for you know living there um versus in the United States that's a a small price to pay for someone with a lot of money so um yeah not not bad at all so um i guess uh we'll go ahead and uh and, and move on here i guess uh did did you have anything else you wanted to talk about in regards to to Liechtenstein or strategic relocation or i guess just international mobility in general i mean what I would just say, though, is that I started out with literally no money when I came to Liechtenstein. I had no money, and I managed to get local people to help me put up the money for my Anstalt by pitching an idea that people liked. So, you know, if anybody with no money wants to get out of the United States, I would suggest to apply to the University of Liechtenstein as a master's student in any of their programs or, you know, whatever, and just get into the country. And then with that visa, they'll, they'll be able to legally work up to 70% for any kind of firm in the country. And once the firm uh, sees if they're a good worker or not, the firm can apply for their visa once they finish school. So, and then they, 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 they you know, they can, you know, have a good, a good standard of living for, for them and their, their offspring. So anyone that wants to get started, I wouldn't say money is required because I didn't have any money and I, and I made it happen. Sure, sure. Okay, okay. Very good, very good. So, I guess uh, uh, so. You uh, in the beginning, you showed a video of where you were there at the, I guess the the Outback. So, um, let, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about that. Then, um, what is uh, the Outback Forum? And kind of give us a rundown of the, the the kinds of talks you've heard. Who were some of the reputable individuals, uh, etc. And we'll we'll start there. Sure. Um, okay. So, Outback Forum is it's called the Europeosha. Alpac Forum, which is basically, it's been going on for, I don't know, since the end of World War II. Um, and the idea is, is to bring countries together in Europe to talk about basically ways to stop Europe from going to war again. Um, I'm not sure which year it was subverted by the left or if it was always part of the left, but it's definitely a full-blown socialist and any, even communist um, event. So you have a lot of speakers here that are like not only pro European Union, but they're basically suggesting. I mean, one of the, one of the professors that was uh, presenting here suggested that you know we all of America's interventions in the Middle East uh, did not succeed because America was not in a union like in a one government state with Europe, and and he would actually like to see the United States of Europe and America in one government, um, basically you know made out of, you know, I don't know, Brussels or, or Washington, D.C. Um, and then we would, and then according to him, our, inter our interventions in the Middle East would have all succeeded, you know? So, wow. um, I mean, they're, they're basically arguing for one, one world government here. And, um, and I've definitely tried to attend different various lectures and, and listen to what they have to say on different topics. Uh, but this is, uh, so far, I haven't had any speakers that, have presented the other side of the story. I've I've only had a, I've only had conversations with a couple of the attendees that are not fully convinced with the story being presented, um, and then and they're more interested in in other opinions. But I but as far as the speakers go, the speakers include speakers like Jeffrey Sachs, who is a well known Nobel Prize winning economist for arguing that you know foreign aid to Africa is what will get Africans out of the poverty trap. Um, so we need to keep giving aid to Africa and all previous aid just wasn't enough. So we just need to give more aid. And of course, we need the government to to redistribute the wealth from Europeans and Americans to Africa. Um, 
And there's also speakers like Jean-Claude Trichet, who, who I'm actually going to be moderating a panel with. So I'll be the moderator of a panel with Jean-Claude Trichet, who is the former president of the European Central Bank. Um, oh, wow. Who's very well known for base. Yeah, he's very well known for breaking one of the founding rules of the European Central Bank, which was that the European Central Bank cannot print money in order to buy debt of member states uh, like, like he did do when he bought the debt of Greece and Italy and Spain um, and Portugal. But I mean, he did it through a loophole where he bought it from banks who had bought it from the member states. So there was like a bank in between, which somehow made it legal. I don't know how, but <laughs> um, yeah, so he's, you know, you know, easier and, uh, you know, just a lot of people like this. Um, the campaign manager for Bernie Sanders is here, um, the marketing campaign manager, and he had a six-day course. I mean, this is a, a this is a 15-day event, and um, every morning there's a course uh, which you can choose which course you want to go to. Um, one of the courses was provided by the the Bernie Sanders campaign manager, and the very first day, you know, he showed a, a picture of Trump, or he showed a speech of Trump, and then um, you know, many people in the class started like flicking off the the projector screen because it was an image of trump and then the teacher started clapping like to celebrate that people in the class were flicking off trump um <laughs> and then he showed a video of a <laughs> he showed a video of a conspiracy theorist basically explaining how how the central bank in the united states was privately owned and then the professor of the class or the, the teacher of the class basically said anyone that thinks the private the central bank is privately owned is stupid um, and, and, you know, that's fake news. But, um, you know, people in the class raised their hand and basically said, no, according to Wikipedia, it is privately owned. I mean, the, the member banks, like the 12 member banks are each privately owned. So I don't really get how this is a conspiracy theory. It's like a fact that on Wikipedia, I mean, it's not only on Wikipedia, you can search anywhere online and see that the Federal Reserve is each member bank is privately owned. So, I mean, um, there's just like a lot of fake news here and um, a lot of climate, a lot of climate stuff, uh, you know, no protest. Tests uh, in the streets by what's called Friday Futures for or Friday for Futures activist group, um, which is you know part of the Greta. I remember her last name, but this Swedish girl. Um, it's all it's all connected to to this girl and uh, yeah, just a lot of stuff like that. And I mean, I've had fun on the one hand um, with the soccer. I mean, they had a soccer event yesterday. I played soccer and you know did some sports. I'll play in the volleyball tournament, but I mean. Uh, on the political agenda, it's it's very leaning in one direction. Yeah, and isn't isn't that sad? The, the kind of the, the highlight of the trip is, you know, not that volleyball is not fun and all, but like you, at the political and economic forum, and it's like you know the soccer was pretty fun. That's uh, that's 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 depressing since that's this, it seems like this is a very very large event. Um, you know, fifteen days, and 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 another thing comes to mind, and I. These people can't like they they can't be that stupid, right? They they have to know that that you know aid to Africa um, is actually the the the, the 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 one thing that they shouldn't do, right? So it's it's it uh, it turns out badly. Um, it's 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 definitely bad. So it ruins it ruins their local economy. But I guess was there was there was there at some was there some point in this conference or was it just over the course of the first few days where you saw the general, um, you know, just the the general way it was going to go? Um, so was there kind of a point in the conference where where you kind of had that realization that wow, uh, the war is lost? Yeah, this is just a communist socialist conference, and yeah, it's uh, it's done. Could you could you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, basically, I was taking these morning lectures. Um, uh, with with an economist who was you know very proud of him, very proud of himself for creating the euro, and uh, very proud of himself for working with Obama on various economic treaties between Europe and, and America, and I just raised a couple of different questions during class. I mean, for example, you know he asked. I mean, it was nice because he actually let me voice my opinion, but he basically asked the class, you know. Why did we create the euro? And I raised my hand and I said, well, you know, basically because the government benefits a lot from the seniorage effect, uh, you know, basically earning money from the from the the uh, value they can sell each unit of currency at compared to the cost they have to pay to produce each unit. And then I also explained the Cantillon effect, which basically redistributes wealth from the the people that get the money, the newly printed money last to the people that get the money uh, the newly printed money first, 
And he responded back, you know, basically, no, that's that's not why we created the euro. We created the euro because there were so many transaction fees in between all the different currencies in in Europe. And and he said, I have a bucket from the 80s of, of different currencies that I had to use when I went to each country. And I responded back to him and I said, well, that's because currencies used to be based on commodities. So you would actually have value in that bucket. If that bucket was worth silver and gold, uh, you know, that bucket would still have value. But and then he said, well, no, we actually had to leave the gold standard because there wasn't enough gold to meet the demand, the growing demand for currency. Of course. <laughs> and again, I came back to him like, yeah, you know, and, and of course, I've studied these topics, you know, so I came back to him again. And I said, well, no, actually, you know, we could have had a bimetallic uh, currency system with silver if they hadn't put a price ceiling, a fixed exchange rate between gold and silver, which basically put a price weight price ceiling on silver, which basically forced people to hoard silver and uh, and then put pressure on, on gold. So um, I don't think that's really a strong argument, the fact that, you know, we didn't have enough inflation in the economy um, because I don't, I'm not convinced by the arguments against inflation, uh, sorry, arguments to, for inflation and against deflation. And, um, and then he said, well, you know, I think that, you know, he said this in front of this group of people. He was like, well, I think Demel's is a little bit confused about her monetary um, <laughs> history and, and economic. But, you know, I'm happy to discuss this with you, Demel's, like during the coffee break, you know. So that was basically the end of that. And then during the coffee break, you know, I was just trying to listen to him explain his basically Keynesian uh, economics. And a girl behind me, I just overheard her saying, you know, anyone that doesn't support Bernie Sanders is you know, basically, uh, you know, trying to, I don't know exactly how she said it, but basically is a greedy, greedy person that is a racist, like a greedy racist person. And I heard her saying this to somebody else behind me. And, and I, I just had to walk away. I was just like, uh, I mean, it's, it has nothing to do. I have, I want the best for people like my father that were taxi drivers that went bankrupt because they didn't understand interest rates. Uh, you know, people that, um, that couldn't, I mean, and also like my mother that didn't have health insurance and that had cancer and, and didn't have any kind of options because the, the market was so extremely regulated, um, over-regulated that nobody could treat her um, in an affordable way. And I mean, I, I want, I mean, it breaks my heart to hear people accuse, accuse people like me of being a capitalist, uh, greedy, uh, racist, uh, you know, simply because I don't want to embrace socialism, which led to the death and suffering of, of hundreds of millions of people. So it, yeah, at that point I just had to like, you know, walk away. And, um, so anyways, uh, so that's basically when I had to, you know, walk away from the situation. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like th these people can't be stupid. They're just evil, uh, especially these, these gatekeepers of the financial world. But yeah. They're, they're just evil. They, they, yeah, they, <laughs> they know why these things actually happened. Um, yeah, they, they know why it went off the gold standard. It was to rob the the newly created wealth of the middle class. They had a stable store of value. Very, you know, they they, they can't have the middle class, uh, you know, uh, producing a you know a, a bunch of wealth without them taking some. So, yeah, it's uh, it's I I can I can only imagine it was uh, it was frustrating. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, I, I guess uh, a question in line with that, and this is something that I've thought about for a while. Um, I mean, when you say the war is lost, um, um, do you mean like the the, the war on the war on education, uh, or I guess uh, not, I guess uh, um, the the war of um, the war is lost of education, like uh, education is not going to work anymore? I mean, what what what's uh, you know what's what war is lost? Is it just uh, the the world's lost to, to communists? Well, I think what I meant with that post is that I've, this is probably the fourth or fifth event I've been to in Europe that's funded by taxpayer money that's a complete socialist or communist event um, over the past couple of years. I, I keep getting invited because I'm, you know, an academic and I'm about to be a PhD and I'm a woman. And so I kind of fit some of their check boxes uh, for people that are allowed to be in here. And, the, you know, they're very well organized and they have a lot of nice you know, fancy sentences and fancy words like solidarity and, um, you know, anti-fascism and whatever, equality and whatever, all this fancy words. And I just see the young people here and they're so convinced. They're, they're so, their minds are so malleable and, and these, these people are, are transforming their minds into being completely socialist and communist uh, leaning. And I don't see 
the free market side having events like this where we're reaching out to the broad population and and you know basically uh, getting these young because these people here they're very they're, the young people here are going to be very influential uh, in government one day these are all like really uh, academic people you know people that are in NGOs uh, whatever um, tons of people that are going to go out and achieve great things or big things for the government not great things but big things and I think we need to also be able to be influencing young minds uh, a lot more than we're doing currently if we want to have any kind of say in the future. So in that sense, that's kind of what I meant by the war is lost because, yeah, it's just these events are going to occur every year and it's going to keep a, f a fresh supply of people that think I'm racist and evil. And uh, and as long as people can't can't see me for my good heart and can't see people like me that hold my views for our good hearts, then, I mean, we're basically painted as evil conspiracy theorists. Uh, and, and as long as people think about us that way, um, we're never going to be able to have a calm conversation with them and, and discuss facts yeah yeah that's that's yeah that's uh that's that's a good point and and, and you know I've, I've i saw this too when i was in when i was in high level indoctrination i didn't see um like the stuff in the media a lot of that um like it, it was it wasn't all that frequent it just always got media attention like i went to a pretty leftist you know mainstream university and i didn't see any of the crazy sjw stuff but but still um i mean you are correct that you know these 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 young these young students aren't flowing into organizations like the freedom for economic education or the mises institute or it's very small numbers of these of these students are right um they're flowing into um you know enlarged to like student democrat associations or for god's sakes the turning point usa um you know the the now socialist you know socialist apologist organization for for uh, for you know the the president so like it, you 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 are correct i mean there there's there's not really a whole lot of um yeah, it's uh, um, certainly certainly uh, you know the millennial generation is is, is leaning socialist, and it, it it's it's something I thought about. I mean, it's it's one reason I started this podcast, focus on solutions, and that's why I focus on solutions. And the other one was. I mean, you think about, uh, you know, fees been around since, you know, 1946. Uh, literature on Austrian economics and free market economics has been around since, you know, formally, I guess, since at least, uh, you know, the late 19th century with Karl Menger. Anarchist philosophy isn't new. I guess the propertarian variety of it kind of uh, in the West is might, might be a little new. But, you know, these things have been around for a while. Um, edu you know, education has been like the focus for a lot of organizations for a long time. I mean, coming up on, a you know, coming up on, I don't know, it's, it's been a long time. That's the point. And. I mean, what are we seeing in the world? We aren't seeing, um, you know, a slow, re a slow return to freedom. Um, no, we're seeing a quite rapid progression towards tyranny. So um, it's a conclusion I came to, I guess, a few years ago that um, I think, I think um, the the notion that education alone, at least, you know, all of our freedom eggs in the same basket. If if we're all if we're relying upon everyone to you know understand it through education, I think that's a um, uh, I think that's a, a very very bad singular bad singular point of focus um because you you are right i mean uh, with uh, with the left with you know with communism and socialism they're a lot more organized and they have a lot of uh, um, a lot of these conferences and organizations and um, they have the propagandizing down to the youth uh, you know down to a t so it's it's um you know it was a, it was a losing proposition to begin with and yeah it just doesn't seem very they're very plausible now to me yeah i mean well that's why it, and then that's kind of why at the end of my post I said, you know, that's why I use Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies, because for me, I agree with you completely. I think, you know, this is we, we we are losing the battle in terms of numbers. And I think, honestly, I kind of understand it because a lot of people are just riding off the back of a few productive people that have merit. And the rest of the whole entire place is just trying to vote in order to redistribute wealth away from us to, to other people. Um, and... If I was in their position, I don't know, maybe I would hold on to the same views. I have no idea, you know. So I think the only solution for me that, that I can align with ethically and to protect my future and the future of my family is to use crypto, save up enough money to buy a piece of land uh, that has a water well on it and, you know, raise kids and, and try to do the best I can. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, I, and, and I guess I, I, I want to just add a caveat here. I don't want to disregard education entirely. I just I just think education is important, for, like especially for individuals that listen, listen to my podcast that read your crypto reports. You know, they're going there for education, right? They, they, they want to learn. Um, and I still think it's completely worthwhile to, to try to reach those folks that, that, will, that will listen. But um, I just think as a, as a general strategy for, you know, Ancapistan or Libertopia, um, I, I think it's just, uh, um, you know, you know um, not great. But yeah, I'm with I'm with you on the solutions. Uh, certainly, there with you on the on, on the homesteading and yeah, um, using yeah using Bitcoin as much as possible. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's it's a, cer certainly a good strategy. Certainly a good strategy. And, and I guess one other thing on education here, because I, I I do want to give credit to Austrian Austrian um, you know economists and economics because it's it, it is very very important. And Max, I had Max Hillebrand on from the World Crypto Network uh, a couple months ago, and he and the way that he put it, and I'll probably badly paraphrase this, but um, you know the theorizing and the philosophizing within the Austrian school was absolutely necessary for the cypherpunks that, that built Bitcoin. So um, you know the focus on education was completely worthwhile because we have Bitcoin now. Um, I don't think it was any any um, any coincidence that um, you know there's a 21 million uh, you know coin cap where it's a deflationary currency. I mean there's character there's free market characteristics that that uh, Bitcoin exhibits that um, certainly um, came from from you know the Austrian school and free market economics and education on that. So yeah, I guess uh, I'll stop rambling and turn it over to you if you have anything. <laughs> Well, that's a fantastic point. I mean, I never thought about it that way, Shane, but uh, definitely uh, Bitcoin came to us because of all the debates uh, going back and forth about monetary economics. And I mean, I'm in, I'm, I'm uh, indebted to the Mises Institute and to Fee and to Mercatus because when I didn't have a dime, uh, those organizations were giving me scholarships or giving me, you know, enough bread and butter to survive another month. So, I mean, I really have have to say thank you to all the organizations that helped me uh, learn and survive financially <clears throat> um, and get to the point to where where I was able to to move to the U uh, move out move out of the US eventually but and I think I think they're all they're doing great jobs still to this day I mean I think that there's a lot of scholars at all of those institutions uh, that are uh, you know really trying to get the word out there in in various ways so that's that's a great point yeah, and, and and I mean, just in terms of, I guess, uh, uh, maybe a, a metric that 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 we could go by to determine whether we're winning or not, is if, um, uh, like, obviously there there are Austrian economists that teach at universities, but like you have to go specifically to those universities. There's there may be only be like a handful of them. Um, I think that a metric that we could that we could use um, to determine if we're winning is if um, <laughs> Austrian, uh, you know, um, economist professors are as uh, prevalent as. I guess they're uh, they're communist counterparts, um, but yeah, yeah. Obviously, we're a little far away from that right now. Um, so, still, still got some work to do, right? <laughs> well, definitely. And I mean, even somebody I was speaking to here, um, who kind of had my views, actually, uh, an American girl uh, from California. She told me she said it's just if you bring up any of these topics, you automatically lose funding. I mean, it's not automatic, but it's like the next time you apply for a grant. Everybody in the department doesn't want to work on the grant with you. If you try to pick a topic that's questioning any of this stuff, you know, you're not going to get funded from the National Science Foundation. You're not going to get funded from any of these big giant pools of government money uh, floating around. Uh, so it's it's yeah, it's it's all the I mean, I think right now it's just very unfair how they allocate money to researchers. And it's yeah, it's just like an, an arm of, of propaganda in, in favor of the government. A lot of these uh, papers that are coming out and studies that are being done. And if you want to have a big career in economics, you know, you need to support the euro, uh, you know, economic integration with with less and less power at the member state level and more and more power at the Brussels uh, level. And uh, yeah, and if you try to challenge that kind of stuff, uh, you, you just don't get funded. So it's... Um, yeah, use Bitcoin and, and and deplete the the pools funding these papers. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's 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 another good point too. I mean, I, I was thinking about this the past couple of days too. I mean, it's it's going to be hard to have objectivity in science or economics or really any field of the human experience when most of the research is government funded because obviously they're they're uh, they're not going to give money to um, a research group that you know has a thesis that is contrary to you know what what they what they want uh, what, whatever they what they want the results of the study to be so um, yeah that's uh, another another very fair point we talked about uh, I, I guess uh, yeah the um, and, and Elio, on Elio radio we talked about uh, you know kind of all of the 
shenanigans going on in the scientific and research field and uh I'm sure it's happening over in uh, over in uh, other countries too. Um, but yeah, it's uh, everything's kind of a racket, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, everything kind of is. So, so I guess the, sol- the solutions we, we we kind of posit for the listeners is uh, you know use Bitcoin and uh, focus on personal freedom because uh, yeah, the the world isn't uh, um, is any, anywhere close to a free society, and if uh, freedom is going to be found, it's on an individual basis. And uh, yeah, so I guess I'll yeah, stop, stop stop rambling there. But uh, I guess uh, do you have any any other closing thoughts for the listeners? Not really. I mean, I'd say that overall Switzerland is just about as good as Liechtenstein. So, I mean, Switzerland is also a huge option for people that want to live in a high trust society with a good earnings and and basically low taxes and a good property rights and and property right enforcement and and everything. And and I would say that my experience with university in Liechtenstein and my experience with university in Switzerland is uh, much better. Um, you, you're allowed to express a much wider range of opinions uh, with without facing, you know, uh, you know, th- threats to lose your job or threats to lose your funding. So I think it's it's a lot more fair in these countries than the, you know in Germany or or Austria where you you have to be on one path in order to get funding. So yeah, that would be that would be my my final. Uh, final comments and and Shane it's really great to have to be on again and uh and I hope to stay in in contact and and I mean maybe for people that even if they can't I don't know get a lot of capital out if there's any way for them to at least get a second passport I mean I don't know if there's possible somehow but anyway any way to get a second passport because you know one fear I would have is is when start when stuff starts to hit the fan in the U.S. it's going to be a mass migration out and yeah. I would want to have my second passport ready at that point. Yes, that is a that is a terrific point. It's something I advised him. Something I advised in my book because um, I mean, yeah, the obviously the, the the you know the tyrants here in the USSA are, are expanding reasons why they can suspend passports, and we aren't even we aren't even at a you know an SHTF scenario yet. So um, yeah, of course that's that's something I, I I definitely recommend, even though for for Irvin Nguyen for this kind of uh, you know radical anarchist kind of ideology, um, you know one one government uh, you know one government piece of one piece of government documentation isn't is is bad enough, but two is is a hard sell, but um, as far as making yourself uh, invulnerable to the coercion, um, the the surely coming fascist coercion of the USSA, then then yeah, you should you should definitely look into getting a second passport. And as I said in my book, probably not from like Pakistan or somewhere like like the UK or so. I, I don't I don't know, but you know, choose a country that's probably going to reciprocate um, well, you know, throughout the world. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point. Um, because that that goes hand in hand with with strategic relocation and perpetual traveling. Because what if your only passport is an American passport and you just travel around every ninety days without visas and such? Um, you could be in a world of hurt. Um, so yes, uh, right there with you. So Demelza, anything else? Uh, and and also, why don't you go ahead and plug? Uh, people want to follow your work or follow you on Twitter. Uh, where can they do so? Oh sure, great. Uh, basically, anyone can follow. Me me on twitter at crypto phd that's at crypto phd and you can send me private messages on there i'm also on linkedin demelza hayes and my report it's available for free uh online crypto research dot report and it's focusing on cryptocurrencies in the german-speaking countries and uh we have basically the largest companies in the space are the official uh partners on the report so yeah the largest companies all um, help uh, with the report and give us insights so that we can we can really actually produce something of high quality that is 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 nice to read. So uh, with like an angle from Austrian economics. So anybody that that wants to uh, reach out to me, I'm I'm always happy to to help people and expand my network and um, yeah, just try to help people on a personal basis. So um, yeah, it's it's great to be on and I hope Shane that over the next couple of years uh, we we see the the whole world get better together. Um, I'll stay <laughs> I'll stay optimistic. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I I certainly hope so. And, and even if the overall political climate gets worse, um, that doesn't therefore mean that uh, you know we as individuals can't uh, you know make strides forward in our own personal freedom. So um, yeah, I certainly appreciate you coming on. Uh, as you know, as as with the last time, I mean, valuable insight uh, with uh, you know a very unique uh, career. You know, teaching a, a blockchain, uh, you know, a cryptocurrency course at a, at a university. Uh, that's uh, certainly fascinating, and uh, we do appreciate um, your insight and, and, and your perspective. So, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you.
Bye. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, so, yeah, big thanks to her for coming on, and a big thanks to you, the listener, uh, for tuning in. Um, I think that's all we have for you today. Uh, please stick around uh, for the Building the Agora segment. Uh, and, yeah, until next time, let's build the Agora, and let's build Second Realms. <laughs> <laughs>